Hello folks, welcome back to Advanced Higher Chemistry. We're having a look at a different category of calculation today. We're having a look at volumetric analysis and the calculations that go with them. That's SQA 113 to 115. Um, let's do the theory first and then we'll run through maybe a couple of examples. Uh, titration basically, that's what this is. Titration questions. Um, so they want you to know how to make a standard solution. That old uh, chestnut, um, that's where you measure out the required mass of a substance. Um, accurately, you do it by difference if you want it to show off on a high accuracy, like at least two decimal place scale. You pop it into a beaker with a small volume of deionized water, stir, um, transfer into uh, the volumetric flask or standard flask, whatever you want to call it. Um, rinse the beaker and the stirring rod that you used at least twice more with fresh deionized water and then top up to the mark. Uh, and lastly, turn the flask up and down a couple of times called inverting the flask in the textbooks to make sure it's all mixed. That's your standard solution. Um, they also want you to know how to use burettes, pipettes and volumetric flasks, when to use which one, choosing an appropriate indicator. Well, that's in the, that's in the theory part of the test, but part of the course, sorry. Um, what else do they want you to know? Oh yeah, they want you to know about primary standards. That's news to us in advanced high. You can't just take any old chemical, weigh it out, and believe what the scale tells you. For a classic example of that would be sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide sits there and does a couple of things over time. For starters, it absorbs water. It's called deliquescence. Or hygroscopic, actually, with a G. Hygro, not hydro, weirdly. Um, it absorbs water, anyway. Uh, which means if you weigh out 10 grams of your sodium hydroxide, you haven't got 10 grams of sodium hydroxide. It's telling you porky pies. You've got about one gram of water and about nine. But about is not good enough, is it? The other thing sodium hydroxide does is it slowly reacts, especially once it's absorbed the water, it slowly reacts with CO2 to become a certain component of sodium carbonate. So it's definitely lying to you. Uh, that's why this is not what is called a primary standard. Primary standards, you have to be able to, for starters, A, buy them with a degree of purity. Not every chemical can be bought pure. Um, they must be totally stable. In other words, not absorb water and uh, not react with CO2. So stable over time. The SQA want you to know that uh, they have to be soluble. <laughs> no, I would never guess that one if I want to make a solution out of it. And the last one the SQA want you to know about is, ideally, it has a high GFM. <laughs> At first glance, what? Why would, you, why would you care about the GFM? That's because you can weigh smaller quantities um, on a scale and still have a large number of moles. You know what I mean? If Let's turn that on its head. Let's say you only required 0.1 of a mole to make up your solution. Now, if the GFM is a nice high number, then your percentage accuracy, the actual the actual mass you're going to be weighing out, would be quite heavy, which means your percentage uncertainty on the scales is small. Whereas if GFM is tiny and you're trying to weigh out like 0.02 of a gram, nope, that's not going to work. So that's why they want a high GFM. Um, some examples that are mentioned specifically in the outcomes, interestingly, are sodium carbonate, hydrated oxalic acid, potassium hydrogen phthalate, Goodness knows we use that one for, didn't need to look that one up. Silver nitrate, yeah, that's handy. Potassium iodate and potassium dichromate. Um, what else do they want you to know? Good question. What is on the last page for volumetric analysis? Um, oh, they just mentioned a few different types of actual titration here, guys. There's the good old-fashioned acid-base ones all the way back from National 5. They still work. There's redox titrations that we introduced at higher. Complexometric titration sounds horrendous, but you're basically just making a complex of a transition metal ion, usually with EDTA as the ligands. Uh, back titrations. Yeah, let's talk about back titrations for a minute or two. Back titrations have to be used under two usual circumstances. Number one, if the thing you're titrating, the thing, take a slap, hey, the chemical you're titrating, uh, for example, calcium carbonate in eggshells. If you were titrating calcium carbonate with hydrochloric acid, in theory you could do that. There's my egg and there's my HCl. Unfortunately, the reason you can't do it in practice is because the reaction is so slow. You have to wait 10 minutes in between adding each drop. Now, if you don't have an entire life to spare, what you can do is you can do a back titration. So, speed might be a reason you need to do these back titrations. Another reason might be a miscibility. If you've got a non-aqueous chemical, for example, an, an oil or a fat, 
and you're trying to do a titration on something in the oil and the fat, then you're only ever going to get two layers formed, which means your reaction is limited to the, the interface. So, uh, miscibility. In other words, the thing you're trying to titrate is a different physical state or a different polarity. These two conditions would suggest we do a back titration instead. So what is a back titration? This is, I take my egg shell, I break it down into powder, and I add a very precise volume of a precisely known concentration of hydrochloric acid in. Except I make sure that I've added too much. So however much egg shell I think here, I'll do the sums and I'll calculate a number of moles of hydrochloric acid and then stick about 20% on top of it. I can then cook this up overnight so that my eggshells totally disappear and almost all of my acid is now reacted. When I say a precise volume, I mean something like exactly 100 mils and a concentration of, say, you know, 3 moles per litre. In other words, I had added precisely 0 0.3 moles of HCl. I will no longer have 0 0.3 moles. I will have possibly 0 0.03 actually now. But the whole point is I knew exactly how much I had at the start. And if I can now work out how much is left, I can then work out how much reacted with the eggshell. How do I know how much is left? Well, I actually take this and I titrate the remaining HCl with something that's a nice primary standard, oh, for example, sodium carbonate solution. So I can do a titration with a sodium carbonate solution of an appropriate concentration. I get the titration results here. That tells me how much hydrochloric acid was actually left. I then compare it to how much I started with. And now I know how much hydrochloric acid actually reacted. And then I can work out how much there was in the eggshell. Little bit round the garden like a teddy bear, but we do get there in the end. Let's try perhaps a couple of examples. Actually, before I try the example, sorry, let me just remind you of the stages that I suggested for titration from last year. They haven't changed any at all. Stage one, I said calculate the moles that dripped out of the burette. Do you know what? I'm going to pause this and not make you, make you watch me write it. So these were my three steps. Calculate the moles that dripped out of the burette. Use the ratio from, of the big numbers, the stoichiometric ratio, if you want to use a fancy term, the big numbers from the balanced equation. That will tell you the ratio between the number of moles of this stuff here and the number of moles of this stuff here. You now know the moles of hydrochloric acid that are left. And then third, calculate whatever you, can, you need in this case. For a back titration, we wouldn't actually do anything with that number of moles apart from subtract it from the original number of moles that you added. Um, right, let's have a look at an example. Uh, this one here is not quite a titration question, but it's a frequently asked, all those crops up, frequent flyer in the multiple choice. And they're saying here, what volume of 0 0.2 molar potassium sulfate is required to make, by dilution with water, a litre of a solution with a potassium ion concentration of 0.1 moles per litre? Talk about a convoluted question. Let's actually run that backwards. So basically you want to make 1,000 centimetres cubed of a solution which contains 0 0.1 moles per litre of potassium ions and it's potassium sulphate we're dealing with K2SO4 so that means for every one mole of this there are two moles of potassium ions so let's tackle that first if you want the potassium ion concentration to be 0 0.1 moles per litre then this number here would actually have to be 0 0.05 I'm hoping you're seeing that 0 0.05 times 2, of course, is 0 0.1. So you actually want 0 0.05 of this whole thing here. As in moles per litre. Uh, sorry, moles. My apologies, because it is one milliliter. So you, put zero, you want 0 0.05 moles of this stuff. And they're saying here, what volume of 0 0.2 moles per litre? So you're starting with 0 0.2. So basically, it's, it's, it's an MVC calculation here. It's just very well disguised. So moles equals volume times concentration. That means the volume that you're looking for, because it is that's the mystery item here. Um, 
the volume is the number of moles you require, which is 0 0.05, over the volume. I apologise, guys, over the concentration. I just finished saying to my wife off camera, this is a heck of a lot easier on the board. I do sincerely apologise. Moles equals... Um, volume equals... Concentration over moles. It would help if I can do some basic maths. Volume equals moles over concentration. So we're talking about 0 0.05 over the concentration, uh, which is 0 0.2. Where's my calculator? Which is 0 0.25 litres, which of course is B. So... Very quick recap. I actually worked backwards on these questions. If it's me, it's potassium ions, and I want a concentration of 0 0.1. So the formula uh, contains two potassiums for every one of the whole thing. So therefore, you actually effectively take that and divide it by that. Um, that ensures that you would have 0 0.1 moles of potassiums, and you want 0 0.05 moles uh, of these guys here. And then it's a volume we're looking for. So volume is moles over concentration, which is 0 0.05 over the concentration that you require at the end. And that's 0 0.2. So it gives a 0 0.25. Let's have a look at this titration. This must be a bit of a tricky one for three marks. So what's going on here? Concentration of ethanol in vodka can be determined by reacting the ethanol with excess acidified dichromate. Ah, so this sounds like a back titration. 20 centimetres cubed of vodka was transferred to a 1 metre uh, volumetric flask and made up to the mark with deionized water. 1 centimetre cubed of the diluted vodka was then pipetted into a conical flask. So they're taking a thousandth out of this. That's 1,000 centimetres cubed. They're only taking one out. 25 mils of the dichromate was added to your conical flask with the 1 mil of diluted vodka stoppered and warmed until the reaction was complete. Right. So, it was found that 1.65 to the negative 4 moles of dichromate ions were left unreacted. And here's the balanced equation, which is nice. So that's 3 ethanols reacts with 2 dichromates. Calculate the concentration of ethanol in the undiluted vodka. That's why it's worth 3 marks. It's got that wee extra squeak at the end. Don't worry about getting all three in these, by the way, even if you can get two out of three. Um, so what's going on here? Let's work out what was in the flask. So, the beaker, rather. Same thing. Uh, one centimetre cubed of pipette into a conical flask, and 20. So, you've got one centimetre cubed of your diluted vodka. And you've also got 25 mils of this. So I wonder if I have cubed of 0 0.01 moles per litre dichromate. I think I would still use my three-step approach. I think I'd work out... Let's work out how many moles of dichromate would actually put into the flask. Because they do tell us that that's left unreacted at the end. So let's work out, using these, how much we actually put into the flask. So that's 25 over 1,000 times 0 0.01. Not much. Yeah. So, 1, 2, 3, 4. So 2.5 times 10 to the minus 4 moles of dichromate were initially put in with your vodka and after they have reacted and oxidized it then you're left with 1.65 to the negative 4 dichromates left so if we subtract the how much was left from how much you started with you will get how much dichromate actually reacted with the ethanol let's do that uh, so 2.5 to the negative 4 
take away 1.65 uh, to the negative 4. Oh, sorry. It's been a long time since I've used this calculator, hence the age of it. I do apologize. So 2.5 to the negative 4. I've forgotten where plus minus is in this calculator. Oh, there we go. Uh, negative 4. Uh, take away 1.65 to the negative 4. Gives us. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five. Oh, wow. Oh, one, two, three, four, five. 8.5 to the negative five. Now that's how many moles of dichromate actually reacted. So we're on stage two now of my three step uh, calculation. Stage one was find out how many moles of dripped, well, it's slightly modification, but we know that that's the number of moles of dichromate that actually reacted, and the ratio is three ethanols to two dichromates. So that's the same as 1.5 to 1. So if that's the moles of dichromate, multiply it by 1.5. That gives us that. Still not very much, but that's the moles of ethanol that were in a uh, the flask here and that was a thousandth of the original one so if we multiply by 1000 that's the number of moles that you started off with now at moles of ethanol that is so we actually had 0 0.1275 moles of c2h 5OH, and that was in 20 centimetres cubed. Do they want the concentrate? I've lost track of what they actually wanted. Now, calculate the concentration of ethanol in moles per litre in the undiluted vodka. Okie dokie. Um, so, that's easy. It's moles over volume. Let's see if we can get it right this time, eh? Six point three seven five moles per liter. An unusual calculation, this one. Sort of weird hybrid between uh, a back titration and just a standard mole reaction. Hopefully that's been of some help to you. By the way, before we leave, the bottom question here says, explain why the acidified potassium dichromate was added in excess. Um, that's to make sure that all the ethanol was oxidised. Thanks for listening, folks. Bye-bye.